been largely um, unaddressed uh, by policymakers, by researchers, by uh, even by advocates, um, and sometimes even promoted as a humane alternative to death penalty. Um, so I think um, you know Pennsylvania stands out because of the policies really that have driven it to be in this position of having so many people with life imprisonment. Um, Pennsylvania is a state where um, a person with a conviction of first degree murder has mandatory life without parole, which is not um, completely unusual, but Pennsylvania is um, rare in its uh, status as a state that has mandatory life without parole for second degree murder, which means um, instances of felony murder, instances where the person was a getaway or accompanied somebody um, uh, in the underlying felony uh, but did not know or did not participate in the uh, homicide. So Pennsylvania stands out for this reason and has you know, accrued its population of lifers uh, as a result. Uh, Pennsylvania also stands out because it had, uh, before uh, recent Supreme Court rulings, it had uh, the most number, uh, highest number of juveniles serving life, people who were under the age of 18 at the time of their crime, including those felony murder uh, folks, um, amounting to over 500 people who were under 18 at the time of their crime and sentenced to life with no chance for parole. Um, it also has very uh, deep racial disparity, 80%, almost 80% of its uh, lifers are people of color. And I think it's around one in nine women in prison in Pennsylvania has a life sentence. Claire Schubert Richards, you, you uh, come into contact with uh, some of these people every day, as well as policymakers who are, are thinking uh, about these issues. Um, what do you view in Pennsylvania as the barriers to parole or clemency in the state? Uh, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman, if he were here, would talk about his uh, very vocal campaign to try to open up those processes for people. But so far, it has been rather piecemeal, I think, right? Yeah, and, and I think we're, we're writing our annual report reflecting back on the last year of our work at the Pennsylvania Prison Society. And one of the things that I was struck by was last February, Governor Wolf had clemency petitions for 14 individuals. Remember, we're in the second or third wave, however you want to call it. People are, people are dying at a great rate in Pennsylvania's prisons and jails because of COVID. Parenthetical, two people have died of COVID this week in Pennsylvania's prisons and jails. But it was even more last February. And the... Um, the Board of Pardons had approved 14 clemency petitions, and they sat on Governor Wolf's desk for weeks, long enough for one of the people to die of COVID. And um, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman was very helpful to us and other members of the advocacy community, um, really pushing Governor Wolf to just get his John Hancock on uh, those clemency petitions. And, um, oh my God, it was ridiculous. I mean, it was like they were stuck in molasses. And, and I think as somebody several steps removed from the governor's office and relying on the advice of people in lieutenant governor's office and others, um, it's just it, for many public officials, it's just not something that you want to be associated with. If, if you don't have to, you just don't want to be associated with people getting out. And, um, and I think that there's a real disconnect. I think many public officials don't understand their proximate responsibility for, um, to reflect on the last panel, for harm and, and death. Dan Nagan, before you became a, a world famous criminologist, you worked in, as, as a, uh, I think, an aide to the former governor of Pennsylvania. And I wonder if that experience uh, taught you something at the time about political pressure and uh, 
demonization, perhaps, that still proves true today. I think that, in part, it's hard to get clemency now in Pennsylvania because of something that bad that happened a long time ago in one specific incident. Yes. Uh, I served in the uh, administration of uh, the late Governor Dick Thornburg um, in, in the 1980s in Pennsylvania. I, I wasn't involved with justice matters. Um, I, was, I was in the, in the Department of Revenue and I was basically in charge of tax policy for, for the, the administration. Um, and, and, and what I learned from that experience is how difficult it is, you know, even on issues that aren't, are not, do not have high um, salience or moral or ethical content to it, these are, you know, you know, changes in the law like, you know, reducing some tax which Pennsylvania had called the capital stock and franchise tax. How you, you had to think in terms of making incremental changes in an accumulative way uh, to, you know, address a larger set of issues because it's very, very hard uh, to, to make radical changes you know in, 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 in government it has it grows you know incrementally and creating a constituency uh, a political constituency to do it can be very difficult because Pennsylvania it, 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 as Ashley described is somewhat unusual uh, it is unusual in, in its heavy use of life imprisonment and life without parole but it's also I think a microcosm of politics. You know, you know, in in the entire country, and uh, and I think we need to, to recognize that the, the process of addressing mass incarceration and reducing it, there, there's not an overall strategy. There actually needs to be 50, 51 strategies, one for each of the fifty states, plus you know the the, uh, the, the federal government uh, as well, and and it's important to have a recognition that. There's an analogy in all 50 states in the Congress to get something passed and in, in, made, made into law in Pennsylvania. You need to have 102 people vote for it in the House and 26 to vote for it in the Senate, and you have to get the governor to sign it. And uh, that's not always you know, easy to do, and it, particularly in these days, um, it, it almost always requires a bipartisan you know, set of votes. So in Pennsylvania, this House and Senate are heavily Republican. The governor uh, is, is, is a Democrat. And trying to come up with something that all parties are willing to agree to and put their, and sign on to is not easy. Uh, Ashley and Claire, uh, I covered earlier this year for NPR a lawsuit seeking to target uh, the mandatory life without parole sentencing of people convicted in Pennsylvania of felony murder. That is, they didn't intend to kill someone. They were, like you said, the getaway driver. They engaged in a crime. Uh, somebody fell down and died in the hospital two weeks later. Those people get life no matter what age they were when they were convicted. Um, that legal challenge was uh, self-styled as death by incarceration. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the aging or geriatric nature of some of these people who are in prison for decades. Um, I mean, I can talk a little bit about, you know, what uh, probably everybody uh, in this room has learned in their uh, coursework about aging out, which is, you know, the general tendency in the age crime curve for people who are at risk for uh, criminal conduct um, to engage in it around their teenage years, late teenage years, um, for that to accelerate uh, for some, to die off for others, but for most people, for that to uh, drop precipitously uh, by their mid-20s and for a so-called chronic offender, maybe somebody who has uh, seven or eight uh, armed robberies, for example, even that person uh, would have desisted from crime um, uh, by their, let's say, four, early 40s. Um, which isn't to say there should be uh, no consequence uh, for uh, breaking the law, but it is to say that when we incarcerate people into their 50s and 60s, 70s and 80s, um, there is no public safety benefit 
And so mm -hmm. um, the argument that we are really lowering crime by doing this does not bear out. Um, you know, just the other day, Henry Montgomery um, of the Montgomery v. Louisiana case, a famous Supreme Court case that invalidated life sentences for juveniles sentenced under mandatory uh, sentencing scheme, was released, uh, which is great news. Henry, I was just texting with um, his caretakers at Louisiana Parole Project this morning. He's doing great and very happy to be free. Uh, but it was no easy road, and his own case was was brought to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that his case in particular, and of course on behalf of the 2,000 others, um, violated the Constitution as, as uh, cruel and unusual. And even though his case uh, was uh, moved to life with the possibility of parole, he was denied parole twice as a 70-some-year-old man who had had virtually no disciplinary record because of spite, uh, because the parole board just did not like the Supreme Court telling it what to do, in my view. Um, and so they put this man, this black man's life, you know, at risk uh, for as long as they could get away with it. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of what we do as a society, and I think, you know, uh, shame on all of us for letting it happen, is we continue to incarcerate people because we're mad at them. Uh, because we're afraid of them, because we don't like the color of their skin, but not because we think they're going to commit another crime, because statistically we know they're not going to commit another crime. So, um, you know, the, today uh, over a third of people serving life without parole are elderly, uh, which in corrections world is 55 and older at best, could be 50 to some, according to some. Um, and so that whole population you know, could stand to be released um, without any real threat to public safety. But not even Henry Montgomery, you know, was able to sail through. So it's a, it's a, it's a big lift. Claire, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, at the Board of Pardons in Pennsylvania, you have to get a unanimous, a unanimous uh, decision from that board, which consists of, uh, I think, the district attorney or the state, or the attorney general of the state of Pennsylvania, uh, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman, uh, some corrections officials. It's, it's hard to get a unanimous decision out of that board. Yes, and in fact, um, prior to Dan becoming a tax analyst <laughs> in the uh, governor's <laughs> office, um, clemency was granted very frequently in Pennsylvania. And um, it was, you know, if you were a lifer, um, and I, and I feel very self-conscious talking about lifers. There are how many in Pennsylvania? Like 6,000. Like 6,000. And so um, lifers in Pennsylvania's 23 state correctional institutions, um, are act, many of them are politically active and organized in lifers associations. Um, the Prison Society often serves as a fiscal sponsor for lifers associations. And... Um, so I am both honored and humbled to speak a little bit from the perspective of members of the Lifers Association. Um, but at any rate, uh, it was thought of, you know, it, guys that I know that were lifers uh, back before the Thornburg administration, you would come up for clemency. And you really worked hard to present yourself as somebody who would contribute to society because you were going to be judged that way. Um, you know, under Thornburg and then the subsequent governor, who I think was Sprat, came what, after, what, who came what, after yeah. Thornburg? Um, no, no. Well, you, you, yeah. it, oh. it got turned off, subsequently turned off and turned off till now we have, uh, we require a unanimous approval. So yes, it was sort of ridiculous that when 14 people got unanimous approval and the, the statement from the governor's office was, we just needed our legal team to review everything. It took them over two months to review this, and whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then Bruce Norris died, and then all of a sudden, uh, uh, then several I mean, pairs of brothers. Later, everything and came out. Yeah. Yeah. He died, and then two days later, suddenly they were able to, to review it. But I think, you know, one of the things that um, I've been thinking about listening to Ashley is um, with regard to your question about the aging population, yeah. is um, it's sort of this. this it's, it's, it's not logical 
right? Like logic went out the window. I think that's part of what, what, why Dan wanted to have this panel because this is a topic in which all the criminology research in the world let's, and fiscal research in the world lets policymakers know that this is Meshuggah, yes. but yet we do it anyway. And I think that, you know, one of the things that came to, to my attention to sort of underline that was um, our main policy agenda at the Prison Society is to eliminate the $5 copay that people who are incarcerated have to pay to access medical care. And it was suspended during the pandemic and um, it has just been reinstated on November 15th. And, you know, the argument that we make is that you have a very medically frail population and that when you create a large barrier to them accessing care, you're going to have to pay for it That's eventually. Right. And so it's, it's, it's a penny wise, a pound foolish. I could go on and on and on. But as we've been making the rounds in Harrisburg talking about this, some of the responses we've gotten from leadership is, well, because we have such an aging population, they get so much better care oh, inside. And inside yeah. than they would outside. <laughs> yeah. Like, in other words, our, our poor funding of community health care right. means that we should fund. So we know that from a public safety perspective, there's no cost benefit to these several thousand people not being eligible for, for parole, because that's all we're talking about. We're not talking about releasing them. We're talking about them being eligible for parole. So we know from a public safety benefit, there's no, there's no benefit. Um, but then there's this sort of weird like, oh, well, but now we can spend our health care on them if we deprive them of their liberty. Which runs into, straight into the uh, spread of COVID, the, the rampant spread of COVID inside facilities where people are confined like the prison seniors. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we've just talked, we've heard from Dan, all, all of this panel, about what the research demonstrates with respect to public safety and recidivism after a certain age and time. And yet, um, it, it crashes state into the politics of, of a largely rural state um, with Democratic-led leadership. And I wonder, I wonder if this is something that if this is a phenomenon that has to do with your gut feeling, whether making sure that people in decision-making capacities should spend more time visiting prisons and meeting with people who are incarcerated. Claire, your organization facilitates that, I think, every day. Yeah, so um, since we were written into Pennsylvania law in 1829, we are the independent eyes and ears um, we have statutory authority to enter and interview anybody incarcerated privately. Um, and we do that with a network of 300 and vol 350 volunteers across the Commonwealth citizens. So for, in many states, the Department of Corrections is the only gatekeeper for who can come in and out. And in Pennsylvania, I'm very humbled and honored that I have equal access to the governor and the Secretary of Corrections and can deputize people to go in and out. I was very happy in the elevator on my way down here. I met a Penn State criminologist who's a prison society volunteer mm. in his county and going into his prison with some frequency. And I think that it is going in and meeting people and being with people, particularly while they're inside and seeing what their life is like and having a conversation. Um, you know, the, the, one of the state officials who I was just talking about who thinks it's really great that we incarcerate elderly people so that they can get better care had been on a press junket that our former Secretary of Corrections had put on uh, a few months ago where they saw the hospice care um, that was at, we have one state facility that is dedicated to people at end of life because we have so many lifers. And, um, and they'd been very impressed. And that's very different than the experience you get at the prison society where you go in and you meet with people privately and you meet with the people who want to talk to you and share with you. And I think that that is a transformative, that's a transformative experience. And I would put out the offer to anyone here who wants to come to Pennsylvania, we're happy to facilitate. Um, if you haven't already coming in and meeting with people 
and and being with people when once you can't other someone these crazy policies are much harder to to perpetuate dan nagan as somebody who studies these phenomena in an academic way these phenomena in an academic way how has uh, meeting with people who are incarcerated changed your approach if at all well uh, is I will acknowledge uh, that I, I don't have, I haven't, have not had a lot of contact uh, with uh, with people in prison, but uh, but I have one re very recent experience with it, uh, and it was a person who was after uh, Claire was talking about the the, the, the the governor sitting on clemency pe petitions. Uh, this this individual, um, uh, the vote the boat, the board voted unanimously. Uh, to, to, to offer him clemency, uh, and it took more than 18 months for, for the, the governor to, you know, to, to finally uh, um, re release him. And, uh, and, the, and I've met this individual. He spent 44 years in prison. Uh, the circumstances of the crime that, that you know, uh, that landed him there are are way too complicated to you know to uh, 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 you know to, to d dissect. But one thing, I mean, two things are clear: he is not a danger uh, to, to, to the to the public public safety. Um, and just to add to um, to uh, Ashley's point about the aging process, uh, I think for those of you who are familiar with my scholarship. Uh, is uh, on deterrence and so forth. You know, the, the evidence is clear that uh, um, that increasing or re increasing already long sentences doesn't add to deterrence. Or conversely, you know, you know, you know, reducing long sentences, already long sentences, doesn't uh, 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 you know uh, have. Uh, reduce deterrence. So to be concrete about that, Ashley um, and Mark and, and the Sentencing Commission has been advocating for you know a 20-year maximum for for a life sentence. And at least with regard to uh, deterrence, I, I I can't imagine that you know that that, that would have any material uh, you know a, a, a crime you know you know effect. I think the thing that though that we need to wrestle with is uh, is getting back to my earlier comment is how can we uh, each in our own way uh, create the, the 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 political will and getting back to my point to get a hundred in the case of Pennsylvania to get 102 votes in the house 26 in the Senate and get the governor to, to sign it and, uh, and I, I think that uh, that to do that, uh, two things you know are, are, are necessary. Getting back to Claire's point about the, this this comment about getting better medical care in prison than in the community, I I would uh, point there would would argue that the, the cost of maintaining you know geriatric pr pr uh, prisoners is extraordinarily high, and from my experience with uh, with with working with uh, you know, uh, politicians um, is that uh, that that those kinds of arguments do resonate with them. Uh, and then another um, uh, important angle is for those of you who are familiar with Marie Godshot's work um, on, on on incarceration. One uh, important point that that uh, that Marie makes uh, in in stripping away the politics uh, of um, uh, of mass incarceration is that you know uh, victim advocacy groups um, have historically um, been some of the prime movers behind you know these kinds of tough sentencing laws and, and, and of various sorts. But Blair, you've made some in interesting observations to me that there there is now the prospect of victim advocacy groups doing just the opposite. I, I sort of toss the ball to you to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, if any of you are familiar with the work of the Alliance for Safety and Justice, that is a national organization. They're actually running a series of bills in Pennsylvania at the moment that um, 
recognize that the majority really work to organize people in communities where the majority of victims of crime and the majority of perpetrators of crime come from. Um, and they, what they're doing in Pennsylvania, is, which I think they do nationally, is they're running sort of pendant legislation that um, addresses the real concerns of victims and works to stem the tide of mass incarceration, um, changing the profile of what we think of as a, what we, what mass media thinks of as a victim to who victims really are and recognizing um, shared concerns. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is, for me, one of, six people have been released on compassionate release this year in Pennsylvania. Six. Six. And we help the majority of them at the Prison Society, and we get them legal counsel and, and help the families navigate the process. And um, one of the, pe the most recent people to be released, gentlemen to be released, um, the victim's family, um, this is somebody who was convicted of a crime of a murder in the 1980s. Um, the victim's family did not object to the release. The victim's family um, it was vengeance, right? It's all about vengeance. The victim's family did not want him re released to hospice care in his sister's house. They wanted him released to hospice care in a hospice facility because when their grandfather had been shot, he was not with his family. Um, I'm now self-conscious that I may have brought us on an unproductive tangent, but where I, what I think strikes me about that, if I can try and make it productive again, was we have this, we have this idea of what a victim wants and who a victim is. And in that case, if this family did not have an objection to this elderly man returning to the community to die. They had a very specific thing, but what's interesting about that was after he was released, and not at the urging of the family, several Pennsylvania legislature, legislators introduced new legislation to end compassionate release based on this guy's release because of the heinousness of his crime, even though the family was fine with him coming. And th what that tells me is that, like, that lawmakers can move quickly, uh, <laughs> you know, when they want to. Right. They act right. as if, oh, it just takes forever to pass a law. But it doesn't when, when they're motivated. And the other thing is that, you know, the, I took the uh, liberty in the pa over the past summer to um, read a lot about the victim's rights movement and the, the, the whole from start to finish, particularly as it relates to uh, domestic violence because of some work I'm doing in that vein. And um, it's really remarkable how much the victim's rights community um, the advocacy community ha does not reflect true victims of crime. Um, and so part of the work that uh, we're doing um, is to try to unveil some of that, you know, that, that um, vic uh, many times victims of violent crime do not want these excessively punitive sentences, number one. Number two, many times victims of crime and perpetrators of crime all come from the same family, community, neighborhood. So they have they lose both their loved one to the crime of violence and then their loved one to a sentence of life without parole. And they find those both of those to be extremely tragic and one of them to have been av avoidable, somewhat avoidable, I mean, both are avoidable, but um, you know, to have, it's not necessarily the wish um, of you know the the victims um, in you know Philadelphia and uh, some of these urban areas where violent crime is is um, you know more rampant. Um, you know it's the the society um, lawmakers have been sold the idea that um, to incarcerate someone from the rest of their lives will provide justice. Um, but if you ask a victim if they're healed by that life sentence, just and we know this empirically from death sentences, they don't necessarily feel that way. Um, on death row, 
there have been a number of studies of family members who watched the execution and then were told, you know, do you feel any better? Do you feel as though you've been healed by this? And they said, no, I don't feel any redemption, any, I don't, I, this is not the healing I wanted, or this is, this didn't do the trick. Um, and, um, you know, so I think part of the work that's in front of this movement uh, and also research um, is to um, really uh, present an accurate picture of what victims of violent crime want. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask one or two more questions, and we're going to open up to audience questions if they have any. Um, you both referenced uh, the Life Without Parole movement, and in particular the movement in juvenile life without parole, which uh, was successful at the Supreme Court, and yet, and yet. And that, it seems to me, took an enormous amount of multidisciplinary work and also a lot of money. So what does that experience demonstrate for people trying to work in Pennsylvania and beyond about what needs to happen next? Well, I think, you know, we talked about this on the, on the prep call that you set up for us. And it's having a really long time frame. And this goes to Dan's point about fundamentally, we just need X number of votes, and some of them have to be in leadership. And I think one of the things that we, I think something that makes that tricky, um, but is really doable with more laser focus than certainly I've seen in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania among our advocacy partners, is that our legislature turns over all the time. They turn over all the time, and now we're having like major redistricting, so what it looked like mm. last year is not going to be what it looks like two years from now. So, you know, what I loved about when we were talking about this, what happened with LWAP was that, that multidisciplinary collaboration had a very long time horizon, which was sped up dramatically by Supreme Court action. And I think the lesson that I take from that is if we have a very long time horizon, like it's not going to be this session. It's not going to be next session. It's not going to be the session after that. But maybe when I'm older um, by a bit, could we set out a horizon for there? And then how do we think about the fact that the leaders that we're going to need for the 2036 session are not the leaders that we have now. And, and, how, and then how does that get us to focus things differently? Yeah, I mean, to, to build on what Claire said, I, I, I mentioned this to, to both she and Carrie before this. I, I, I think you have to take a very long view uh, on this to be real. Given the, to be realistic about the politics, but, but I think it, it is with small steps. It, it may have to be. It is possible. And the analogy I would offer um, is is described in in, in, a, in a, a really wonderful book. If you haven't read it, it's called Simple Justice, and it's it's about uh, the strategy that was laid out by the NAACP in the early part of the 20th century to overturn. Um, separate but equal, and what that strategy was uh, was was built on was on the idea that we got to take small steps forward to ultimately lead us to what was Brown versus the Board of Education, and so like the initial steps that and this was a conscious strategy on their part was first of all to challenge to do challenges not in the Deep South but places like North Carolina where there was no more room, and then um, challenging the most obvious uh, places where the, the separate but equal wasn't being met. For example, uh, there wasn't at the time one of their first cases was that there wasn't uh, there was a white uh, there was a school a dental school for whites but no for black none for blacks. And then so they challenged that and say, well, how can this be you know separate but equal in one? And then they sort of kept marching on you know. A, a, forward, and it took them close to 40 years to do it, but they finally um, were, su were, were successful in, in, in uh, Brown versus the Board of Education. And I think a similar 
kind of strategy is necessary to unwind the mass incarceration because I think we have to recognize that, you know, it is, and we pointed this out, is that from the, 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 the peak in around 2000, a decade ago, you know, we're down by 12%, okay? Uh, but we're still five times higher than we were in, in the early 19, uh, in, in the early 1970s. 1972 was actually when, uh, you know, things started marching. And, uh, and it's gonna take a long time uh, to do it, um, but there are different roles. I, I feel that there are, there, there are different roles in various ways that we can all play in, in, in creating the political will uh, to do something about this. And, and, and I keep repeating this, is for mass incarceration to be uh, unwound, it has to be unwound in 50 states and, and, and the federal government. And it's gonna be a long, slow process. Uh, I'd also point out that the Supreme Court had something to say both about juvenile life without parole mm -hmm. and Brown v. Board and separate but equal. And the Supreme Court, um, does not seem to be very favorable to most defendants' rights, but we'll, we'll see. It could be a long game indeed. We are running very short on time. I have one last lightning round question for Ashley, and then we're gonna go to audience questions. Uh, this audience is filled with um, extremely talented and dogged researchers. People who, who study these issues, what is the role of the researcher in combating this challenge? Um, that's a great question, and I'm also glad that I had a little bit of time to think about it because I have um, I have a list. Um, oh, <laughs> good. <laughs> um, so some of the research I think you know, the research that is mostly out there is is the counts, right? So it's growing. Um, um, you know, 66 percent more people serving life today than when we first started counting in um, in 2003. Um, but we need to know more about the nuance of the people serving. Um, in particular, um, I've been focusing on women, um, and a lot of the focus on women could touch on uh, feminist criminology work um, because a, a good share, and I don't know the specifics yet, but maybe you could find this out, um, uh, are women who have a committed violence, committed homicide in order to escape domestic violence. Um, uh, there's another good share of women who have committed homicide uh, or uh, some serious crime and received a life sentence uh, be under uh, coercive control of a, of a partner, the threat of leaving, the threat of harming the children um, if they don't participate in this crime. Um, and my um, sort of overall uh, desire about this is, to, is uh, part of that, how do we end life imprisonment? And one way is to get at these more sympathetic cases, right? The juveniles was a very, very good example. Uh, women who are survivors of domestic violence and have committed homicide in order to survive themselves or save their children. Um, there is not any research on the women serving life, although I know anecdotally from knowing many of the women that this is precisely what they did. Um, there isn't enough research out there on the racial dynamics, uh, particularly race of the victim. We know this in domestic, I mean, death penalty uh, work that that became critical, um, that the race of the victim, uh, particularly uh, the victim being white and the perpetrator being black, um, played a significant role in whether the death penalty. Um, it's a little trickier, of course, with life without parole because a sentence of life without parole might actually be a win if the person was facing the death penalty. But, you know, uh, sophisticated research can sort of tease all that out or work in states where death penalty is not an issue. Uh, the state uh, specifically doesn't have the death penalty. Um, I also think it's important, um, you know, to look at the prosecutorial charging patterns. Um, I have uh, some very preliminary research um, that uh, suggests that uh, prosecutors um, in rural areas are more likely to uh, try to get LWOP for very similar crimes than prosecutors in um, urban areas, and there's, um, you know, reasons for that. But there, but that research isn't built out enough. Um, and um, and I'll just leave another one um, with you as an idea, which would be um, the geriatric population um, and the percentage very simplistically, of people who are released 
on a life sentence after the age of 50, 55, who then go on to commit new crimes. Um, all of the research out there that I have seen, um, which is small but, uh, but not absent completely, uh, suggests that it's about 2 or 3 percent reconviction rate. Um, that's uh, substantially lower than other, uh, other people who are released from prison. Um, so, you know, I think if, if I can also just build on the question for a moment, um, you know, my um, impetus for making these suggestions is that um, our um, purpose in academic research ought to move beyond um, research for research's sake um, and toward uh, really dismantling mass incarceration uh, piece by piece, as Dan suggests. And so any research um, that um, you know, undermines the, um, the utility of one of our prison sentences, and this is one that is being relied on more and more, um, may you know, work to, um, to, to um, shorten sentences, bring people out of prison, and reconnect them with their families so that they can contribute to society in positive ways, which is what many of them want to do. Dan Nagan, I want to pose that question to you too, since this is your panel, okay. and you are you are the boss of this <laughs> organization. So bad, this year. <laughs> let, let me. Uh, I will just add to uh, what uh, Ashley said. What, what, make two points. One is, I, I I think it's really important that more criminologists engage in doing the kind of policy analysis type work. That, uh, that Ashley has been doing, you know, uh, well, throughout her career at the Sentencing Commission, but I think sort of with regard to life imprisonment, probably now for the last five, six years. Or did you ten. Okay, ten. Uh, but, to, but to do, I mean, to do, we need to have more of that happening. Uh, one meeting I had with the policy committee was where we were talking about, well, what can we do in various ways to incentivize, uh, you know, a criminologist uh, to do this kind of policy analysis work. But I, I would also expand it out and say that there, there's also um, important work for people who have a different taste in research. I mean, that's why, I mean, that, that, that's what we all do these things, uh, you know, for, very, for diff different kinds of reasons. And there are some important questions of, of basic research uh, that, uh, that I think criminologists should take on is, uh, one is I think better understanding the dynamics of victim advocacy groups and how th 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 that dynamics, you know, with ultimately with the idea of trying to make suggestions for how those dynamics uh, can be pushed in a way to create a political constituency, you know, for reducing, not, you know, increasing sentences. And a related uh, point, I've talked an, a, a quite a bit about politics here in this for the reasons I described. I think it's important here to understand that this problem goes way, way beyond partisan politics. This is not a red-blue issue. And uh, again, I'll you know, uh, uh, pick up on Ashley's latest report, because I'm going to be talking about this this evening, but just to, to make a point is, uh, is uh, bright red Utah, you know, has the highest percentage uh, of uh, lifers in its um, in its uh, among its population. Is I think it's my memory is it's thirty five percent. But uh, guess what state has the lowest percentage at five percent? Is North Dakota, which is even brighter red than uh, than than is Utah, and and there was other examples uh, of this as well. And I think we need to understand what is better understand the politics of why it is, it's, why it's so hard uh, to get uh, state legislators, to put this, to get these kinds of problems on the radar screens of state legislators, because unless, until you get it on their radar screen, nothing's going to happen. Well, uh, and I want to bring this uh, this back before we open up to the audience to Claire. Um, you know, later tonight, Brian Stevenson uh, of EJI is going to be getting an award, and one of the most important points that he has made for decades now is uh, in order to understand a problem or a challenge, you need to get right up close to it. Um, how many what lawmakers in Pennsylvania are taking you up on your offer to go visit people in prison? 
And how many survivors of crime and family members are doing that? I think it's more and more, and I think that um, it's incumbent on all of us. I, I was just thinking about this right now. You know, pe um, we have a crisis in our jail in Philadelphia, and um, and people are are killing each other because there are no staff to prevent it, and. Um, our mayor doesn't understand that he's proximately responsible for this. And part of my, you know, as we've been strategizing about it, is, is having him actually talk to some of these families and, and, and people so that you can get um, an understanding of the proximate experience. And it's incumbent on my organization and others to make that possible. Those of us that bridge the divide, it's, it's our responsibility to do it more and more and more. And, and you know, for those of you that do research in prisons, I think it's, you join us in, in, in shouldering that burden. We're gonna open up to audience questions now. There's a microphone right in the center if you uh, have some questions for this excellent panel. And if not, I'm gonna pose another one, which is the following. Um, it seems to me that the, that uh, it, political figures have been conditioned since the 1980s and maybe for a century and a half before then to f completely understand the risk of releasing someone who may go out and commit another offense. That's been very understandable um, since the George H.W. Bush era, at least in modern politics, right? Um, but for some reason in Pennsylvania, even for somewhat sympathetic Democratic lawmakers, the prospect of somebody dying awaiting release during a COVID pandemic in prison didn't really have the same political cost. And I wonder why that is, and I wonder what is the role of the criminologist and the social scientist in that story, if at all. Maybe it's my job. I, don't know. I mean, it's it's a, yeah, it's media, but it's also ours um, in terms of really changing that narrative. I mean, I hear it every time I've given a talk, I almost always get a question. But what about somebody who's a serial rapist? And um, or what about um, you know fill in the blank, Kyle Rittenhouse, anybody who's just a really really terrible person? And I think um, you know it's sort of just. It derails the whole conversation because we're talking about 200,000 people who are serving life sentences, one in seven people in prison who has life. So I and, you know, and I would think everybody here doesn't think that um, somebody who is currently a serial rapist should be out on the streets um, or who is, you know, says, when I get out, I'm going to be a serial rapist. Um, but the vast majority of people who are in prison these lifers who you get to know if you go visit there are docile. They are the mentors of the prison uh, environment. They are pillars to the young people. Uh, they are engaged in every programming they could possibly get involved in. And so there's like a narrative shift that really has to happen. Um, you know, when you were mentioning the 80s, um, Willie Horton, you know, that I think everyone knows at least the, the background, the, the basics of that story, but he came from Massachusetts. He was a Massachusetts inmate. Um, and in his program, which is a furlough program, which are, you know, long gone now for the most part, 99% of the people who were in that furlough program returned. He obviously didn't, um, but 99% of them returned successfully. And, you know, once you hear about what happened to him, of course, you can't be like, well, most of them came back. But it's true that, you know, that, that had a very high success rate. Um, so we have a lot of work to do. I think r media has work to do and researchers have work to do and policymakers certainly have some thinking to do about, um, you know, yes, there are going to be, there are definitely going to be issues, but they're going to be very rare. And to, to, to take away the lives of, you know, 200,000 people or 199,000 people because of that, you know, should weigh very heavily on us. Dan, you talked about uh, incremental, what you called incremental, or halfway steps. Um, in Pennsylvania, as we discussed, uh, felony murder, second-degree murder, means mandatory life without parole. 
Right. Is that the place to start in your view, or do you need to start somewhere else, do you think? Well, in the, in the case of Pennsylvania politics, uh, is yes, you need to start someplace else because there's no way, given the current p political situation in, in Pennsylvania, that you're going to get a, the legislature to repeal uh, the, the second degree, you know, the felony, the, the felony murder in, 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 second, in second degree murder. I think where there are realistic uh, first steps uh, to do is, <coughs> excuse me, is to allow a, a judge and a jury to make some judgment about whether or not uh, the circumstances of this crime warrant a, um, uh, a felony murder conviction and, and, you know, and a mandatory life sentence. That, I, I recognize that that is a really small step, uh, but m m my understanding is that that's the kind of thing that you might get through the Pennsylvania legislature. And an additional example of that is allowing the parole board uh, to, um, to, <coughs> to recommend parole for people with life sentences, which they're not allowed to do now. I mean, absent those two small steps, I acknowledge are really small steps, the only way uh, that a person with a life sentence in Pennsylvania can be released from prison is with a commutation by the governor. And it requires, as, uh, as Claire uh, described earlier, it requires a, a, a unanimous vote of the commutation uh, uh, um, uh, group commission, and then the governor willing to put, you know, his signature on it, and and so there's that results in just a, simply a trickle of, of 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 prison releases. So those are the kinds of, of of modest steps that I think you know that could happen in Pennsylvania, and I think that there's, as I said, Pennsylvania is you know it, it, as for those of, of the the those of us who are old enough to remember Tip O'Neill uh, is, you know, Tip O'Neill, you know, made the point that all politics is local, and he was right about that. And so there are particular political circumstances in Pennsylvania, but Pennsylvania is also a microcosm, you know, of the you know entire country, and so there are going to be variants of these small steps that I think we all need to put our our, our shoulder against to push through so that over the much longer haul, uh, we can unravel mass incarceration. I'm gonna play devil's advocate here, Dan, and I'm gonna put Claire on the spot, and that's this way. Um, at the federal level, which is a much different kind of system than the state of Pennsylvania, uh, there were some reforms passed by Congress, bipartisan reforms like the First Step Act, which have helped thousands of people, but continue to be criticized as mostly um, half a loaf, maybe a quarter of a loaf at this point. Mm -hmm. um, they're unrealized promises, right? And so if, if you're an advocate who wants to go big, why do you start out asking for something small? Well, I, you know, we need all ranges in the choir. And so for some advocates, asking to go big is what is your range. And you should be singing that range and that's good because it moves everything over to the left. Um, but we need other strong voices in the choir that are incrementalists. And I think that's actually where we fall short in Pennsylvania. We have a lot of great members on the far ends of the choir. And we don't have a lot of loud, funded, persistent, long-range thinkers in the middle of the chorus. And I say this leading an organization that actually needs to be not as incremental as, as some other organizations. I mean, given our role, we are not as far, I don't know what range you want to give the left, but we're not as far in one range as, as others. But, um, but I think that there, there needs to be a, a louder, moderate, incremental voice that doesn't mean that the voices for big reform should go away they need to be offset. And I think um, we were having a, as you know, we've been having conversations with legislators. I've mentioned it three times. But one of the things 
that struck me in our, in, in their, our most recent uh, tour of the halls of Harrisburg were the frustrations um, of some legislators who had wanted modest incremental reform and were getting no love from either side. I mean, like all of us, legislators want to feel like you're doing something good and that everybody likes you and you're going forward. And I think that um, members of the Pennsylvania criminal legal reform world community that I'm a proud member of have shot ourselves in the foot a little because we have inundated the legislature with a gazillion bills, some of which are quite complicated. So we haven't given them an easy way to have a small incremental win that everybody feels good about. Now, we did two sessions ago. Some of you may be familiar with the clean slate legislation yeah. in Pennsylvania of automatic um, record sealing, which was really small, um, but we've built on and built on and built on. And we actually, out of that, a small criminal justice reform caucus was created, bipartisan caucus was created. They also got great press and they got flown to different places to talk about it. So for the legislators, it was a, it was a boondoggle. It was good press. It was bipartisan. It was a win. It took them three sessions. We have two-year sessions, so it took them six years to get it. But they got it, and they were poised to do more. And instead of just giving them teeny, teeny, teeny steps, um, we've thrown a bunch of big things at them, and, um, and they're frustrated. Ashley, how do you make sense of this from a national perspective? And is there some place that seems to be accomplishing some of these goals? Like ending life imprisonment? Well, um, a halfway it's or definitely or... piecemeal. I mean, with the exception of the Supreme Court rulings, which you know really came out, I think no, everybody was surprised they moved so quickly. And now, of course, they've come to a sudden stop with, with the Jones ruling. But um, the I think states that do make progress, it's very incremental. Um, you know, so California, uh, with its three strikes, was able to release some lifers as a result of that. Um, and there have been, um, you know, some state, uh, Michigan also had, a, had small reforms, um, but there are some states where it's, um, you know, when there is criminal justice reform proposal put on the table, often, um, too often, lifers are sort of the bargaining tool, you know? Oh. We're gonna make this reform, but don't worry, anyone with a life sentence will never benefit, you know? And then, then the, the reform passes through. So it's been, you know, I wouldn't say there has been very much progress yet, sometimes because, you know, and of course, life imprisonment without the possibility of parole is the alternative to the death penalty and is sometimes you know used as the you know humane alternative to that so i would say we have not we don't have any really big wins yet um particularly evidenced by the numbers which are that they're four percent higher this year than they were four years ago so um you know i think piecemeal as much as i feel you know um that we should not have lwap just across the board it should everyone should have the opportunity for parole. Whether they get it is another matter, but um, uh, so far where there have been victories, they've been small and, and through these sort of, you know, not, not um, you know, through small incremental change. Yeah, and to punctuate your point, Henry Montgomery got out of prison this week and went into a halfway house, and uh, uh, Juliet Jones in Oklahoma was right. not executed, but the governor has, uh, try to make sure that he has no possibility of release. Right. And Julius Jones has maintained his innocence right. for decades now. I mean, I tweeted about this this morning that, um, you know, that it's, it, it should not be okay. It should not be considered to be a win or a lucky break that you get LWAP uh, when, you were fa when you shouldn't have even been facing the death penalty. I mean, they, they, they commuted him because of so many legitimate claims of innocence. So they say, oh, okay, well, you can have LWAP. But I mean, why LWAP? Why prison if you're innocent? <laughs> but I guess what your point is, is that, you know, it, it, these wins are so small. You know, I mean, Henry's out, but look what it took. Mm -hmm. no, nothing, I, I, no, nothing more to add. I wonder, maybe, are there any questions? <laughs> no. 
you know, I have one last question, and okay. that's this. Um, why do people like yourselves spend careers on these issues when uh, it's really hard work and the winds are few and far between? I mean, for me, I, you know, fell in love with this work when I did um, a survey of the juveniles um, in 2012. So I'd already done one census of all lifers, um, but I started to meet the juveniles. The, they were no longer juveniles. They were my age, uh, mostly. Most of the, the juvenile lifers are in their 40s now. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that th this was before the rulings uh, that invalidated their sentences, that I interviewed them. Um, and that they, um, you know, they were, when, when they received the survey um, from me, they wrote back, you know, with, with nothing to hope for. Um, they were just so glad to get the mail, you know, because they had, for many of them, they had not received anything. You know, family members are very likely with lifers to just cut them off because of the, it's so painful. Um, or vice versa. And so they were just so grateful to be asked these questions about their life. And it was like, um, you know, nobody had spoken to them. Um, and they were real people, you know. These are, you know, I think because of the nature of prisons being out of view, we can forget that these are human beings um, and that they have made a terrible mistake, no question. Um, but that they also had other factors. There's more context to their life. So I started to meet them, and, you know, I've just stayed loyal to them. You know, I, I had a correspondence with a North Carolina lifer recently. I was speaking on the phone, actually, and I was saying, you know, this work is very frustrating, especially with the pandemic, you know, six people getting released, you know, and all this. Um, uh, and I was saying to him, just in confidence, you know, I don't even really – Maybe there's something else I should be doing, you know, that's more effective. And he was saying, you know, even to, to us, like, I don't know what's going on outside prison, but to us lifers, your work is, is really what keeps us going. And um, because we don't have another voice, yeah. you know, other than the work that, you, not just me, but of course the others that are doing this work. And that, you know, that to me is, is why I do it, is for, for them entirely. Yeah, you know, I, um, I did not choose this work. Um, I kind of got, uh, circumstances happened and I ended up where I am. And if I was authoring things intentionally, I would not be here doing what I'm doing. Um, but I love it. I, my deputy director said to me um, yesterday as I was talking to him on the phone, he was like, I love my job. I said, oh, I love my job too. And I think actually, I think all of us on staff and our volunteer who I just met in the elevator, we love our work. And I think the reason why we love our work is because we do make a difference all the time. Pennsylvania, and, but we make, our, we make a difference on these ridiculous things. So you have to be okay that you can't just solve it all. So Pennsylvania was not reopening for in-person family visits, whereas all of our neighboring states had. So we went after it, and a week after we launched our campaign, the first visit started. Oh my gosh. Um, we have, you know, we're an ombuds, so we have people who we help every day. We, we facilitate, uh, again, with family visits, we facilitate people who don't know how to navigate the virtual visiting platform for the DOC come to our office. They sit in the conference room next to me, and I hear, families talking to their loved ones for the first time in three years and crying, even though Pennsylvania switched from Zoom to Polycom, so now the audio goes out every three minutes. <laughs> even still, between the tears, they can talk. Um, and we, we make a difference in people's lives. And that's awesome. Dan, a reflection from you? Well, I mean, I, I think that the, the reason I, I've become passionate about this, I've spent a, a good part of my career, you know, uh, studying the, the sort of the crime, you know, how and what extent do, uh, do 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 criminal sanctions prevent crime? And uh, and the more I looked at this, you know, the more I came to the conclusion this makes no sense. It's not. It's not. The, the, these kinds of policies are not making for a safer 
society, and they're the source of just an enormous injustices. And so that uh, you know uh, uh, that you know they need to be addressed. And you know, and uh, as, as for your question of what you know, given how hard change it is, is I think I just I believe in persistence. You know, you just got to keep at it, and uh, you know, and 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 try to to make a, a a difference in that way. So that's why I do it. Thank you so much. And I just want to say. As somebody who did a story involving Pennsylvania LWAP this year, um, I, I had been communicating via phone with a number of, of people who are behind bars for life, some of whom are just in their early 40s. And one stopped calling me back this year and stopped emailing. And I thought, oh my god. And then one day he called, and he couldn't catch his breath because he had contracted COVID. But he's OK. And that, that period of time in between not hearing from him via phone or email and then hearing from him again was a very challenging period of time. So that communicated to me in a way that is hard for some people to understand that this is about people's day-to-day -day lives and experience and, and whether they can survive long enough to talk to their family members again. Thank you so much to this excellent thank, panel for all. Thank you very much for your, 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 your attention.